and welcome to First Baptist Oakers. Our welcome and call to worship this morning is going to come from Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, we'll begin, uh, we'll begin reading in verse 1. As you are turning there, just a, a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, I didn't bring my mask this morning because I thought we were clear and good to go because the president said we were, but then I, the Sunday school told me that we weren't because our state isn't. So I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do or whatever. So basically, uh, at this point, uh, well, maybe some of you have heard that if you're fully vaccinated, the president said you don't need to wear a mask. And then I guess our, our state said differently. Um, and uh, we're not going to get a state versus national today. Uh, but uh, as far as whatever you, you feel free doing, feel comfortable doing, that's what we hope you would do. Um, I think we've all been pretty wise, and I've been really encouraged with the way our church has responded over this last, well, well over a year now. Uh, so we'll exercise wisdom, and uh, if, you, if you feel like you, you, you want to wear a mask, by all means, I encourage you to do so. And, uh, and so that's just the, the route we'll go. I'll look into it this week and see what we have to do, because it'll probably change. And, um, and then it'll change again. And uh, we'll just keep adapting like we have been this whole time, right? Patience and flexibility. And uh, again, I just want to commend you for your patience and your flexibility uh, with us. Also, uh, our Wednesday night prayer, this, this Wednesday only, we're going to move it to five. Um, I have a very important t-ball game that I have to coach. <laughs> Um, and the other coach's son has been sick, so he hasn't been there. And if you don't have a coach in T-ball, um, it's pretty chaotic, even with a coach. So um, just this Wednesday, we're going to move prayer, uh, the prayer meeting to 5. It'll go 5 to 5.30 for just this Wednesday. And uh, so it, it will still meet here in the sanctuary at, at, at 5 p.m. this Wednesday. Also, if you'd like to be a part of our email list, there's the contact cards on your chairs. And if you wouldn't mind filling that out, adding it, uh, and then dropping it in the offering box and putting your email on there, of course, so we can add you to our email list for updates and, and prayer requests. We'd love for you to, to do that. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and let's turn our attention to God's Word. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. God's Word says, But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, and Lord, we thank you that you have created us, you have formed us, and through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have redeemed us. And that you call us by name and that, that we are yours. Father, we thank you that when we pass through the waters, through trials and difficulties, Lord, as you promise here, that you are with us. You are guiding us. You are leading us. You are directing us. So, Lord, may we, uh, may we keep that in mind as we face the, the trials and the hardships of life. That you are with us and that we are yours. Lord God, we just ask that your blessing would be upon this service today. May you be honored and, and glorified. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand and join us in the
reading this morning out of third chapter of First Peter. And who will harm you if you are passionate for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be disturbed, but set apart the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping your conscience clear so that when you are accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. God expects us to be prepared at all times to give a witness about what Christ has done in our personal lives. Practicing Christian money management helps us to give generously a powerful witness to other Christians and non-Christians. turning your Bibles with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. We'll begin reading in verse 1 as we make our way through the book of 2 Kings. I know we asked you to sit down. If you are able to, would you please stand in order to honor the reading of the words of our God. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 1. If you are able to. The Word of God says, Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. And he said, Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, Empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go. Sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, and Lord, we thank you for these truths unchanging since the dawn of time. Lord, that remind us of your compassion, your nearness to us, your love and your mercy and your grace upon us who are undeserving. Undeserving of your grace, undeserving of the salvation that you have so lavishly given us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, I ask now that you would be glorified through the preaching of your word, so that every heart might confess that Christ is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with thee, thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. I, I think of these words as we come to 2 Kings chapter 4 and we see this widow in her distress. We see that these waters, these rivers of sorrow have overflowed in her life with the loss of her husband and now awaiting the loss of her own children. As we've come to chapter 4, we've seen... God's mighty acts of deliverance for His people at, at the national level. Last week, right, we saw the three kings in the wilderness. They didn't have water. And the Lord miraculously provides for these three armies. God's actions have been on display through Elisha at sort of the national level, or we could say the international level. But in verse 1, we meet this widow in distress. The rivers of sorrow have flowed. She's lost her husband. Uh, her grief is compounded only by her debt. And the statement, the creditor has come. So what is the Lord going to do? 
Well, He's going to show her His compassion, His goodness. For He is with her. He is not going to allow those rivers of sorrow to overflow. His grace all sufficient is going to be her supply. And as we look at chapter 4, it, it, it takes place in a longer section in the book of 2 Kings. Think of 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1, all the way through chapter 6, verse 7. There's this long section that is, that is displaying God's power through Elisha. Remember, the Lord's been working through Elisha to show that Elisha is the Lord's chosen servant. He is the prophet to secede Elijah. Chapter 4 itself contains four miracles all happening at, at, at the local level, the, the grassroots level, if you will. We've seen idolatry taking place at the national level and, and the danger of continuing in that idolatry and that foolishness where that leads. That leads to foolish uh, decisions. That leads to state-sponsored idolatry, to foolish word, uh, foolish. Uh, wars and the wrath of God. But what's happening at the local level? In the midst of such national idolatry, how is God at work? How is God working? Well, that's what chapter 4 shows us. It shows us the power of Yahweh, the power of the one true God, the compassion of God in helping this widow get out of debt. In helping, as we'll see next week, this this wealthy woman who's blessed with a son and then the son dies and then is raised to life. It, it, it shows us the power of God through Elisha in purifying a deadly stew and in a miraculous wilderness feeding. And what we have in chapter 4, all of these miracles actually give us a glimpse of the coming kingdom. Uh, th there are a lot of parallels here in chapter 4, the ministry of Elisha with the ministry of Jesus in the gospel. A widow receiving back her dead son. A miraculous feeding of a multitude. Those are all miracles that Jesus Himself will do. In the midst of such national sin, such national turning their back uh, on, on God, God is still at work locally. While the nation is spiraling further and further into sin, we meet this widow, this woman in verse 1 who is now a widow because her husband has died. Her husband is described as one of the sons of the prophets. We don't know exactly who they are, but they served in some way the prophetic ministry of Elijah and Elisha. And she explains that her deceased husband was one who was Elisha's servant and that he feared the Lord. And so despite all of the sin that's taking place at the national level, there's still those who are serving and fearing Yahweh. There are those who have not bowed their knee to Baal. So we see her in her desperate situation, right? Her husband's dead. Her husband, who would have been the provider for the family. The, the means of provision for her and her family. And not only does she experience the loss of her husband, she's now about to experience the loss of her children. You see her sort of distress, right? In those words. But the creditor has come. To take away my two children. To be his slaves. So the scene, we, you can picture it, right? This woman is in grief. <coughs> this man shows up at her house and she's in grief. Her, her husband is, is gone. And yet he still has debts to pay. And so this man shows up. Maybe she's thinking he's going to have compassion on her. Maybe he'll forgive her her debt, or maybe allow her to pay it back over time. But no, he's there to collect. He's not there to show compassion. There's no compassion here, just collection, just money. He's there to get paid. And she pleads with him that she has nothing. He works his way through her house. She has no livestock. She has no metals. She has nothing. And then his eyes fall on her children. She has nothing of material worth. Well, then he'll take her children from her. He doesn't see this widow in her desperation. He, he doesn't. He understands that, that the sons that she has will be the only way that she could survive. Because they would provide for her. He only sees them as assets. 
You know, friends, that this could happen really demonstrates the sort of moral tailspin that the people had entered into, right? The, the moral decline that had happened. In, in the Pentateuch, there were laws safeguarding those who were in debt and, and protection and, and laws protecting the poor and widows. But what's God's word when there's money to be collected? Here you have a woman in a desperate situation. Her husband's dead. She's in debt. She's about to lose her children. And where does she turn? She turns to the Lord, to God. You say, well, wait. She goes to Elijah. Well, who is Elijah? He's God's ambassador, right? And in one sense, when she's crying out to Elijah, she's crying out in faith to Yahweh. Think of it, friends. She could have turned her back to the Lord, turned her back on the Lord. Her husband, remember, they had been faithful to Yahweh. Despite all of the idolatry that's going on around them, he had remained faithful to the Lord. When faithfulness to the Lord was costly. Remember who has been king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel and their sons, right? And who had killed the followers of Yahweh. They served the Lord faithfully. But now he's dead. And she's in a desperate situation with her death. Think about it. It would be like someone today serving the Lord faithfully, clinging, clinging to Christ in faith, but now the cancer has returned. But now they've lost their job, or now they've lost their love. In, in faith and in desperation, she cries out to Elisha. Instead of turning her back on God, she turns to Him in faith. Friends, when trials and difficulties happen in your life, do you find yourself turning to God? Or do you find yourself turning away from Him? Do you go to Him in desperate faith, crying out to Him in prayer? Or do you turn from Him in silence and in anger? When your pathway lies through fiery trials, do you turn to a supply of all-sufficient grace, or do you turn away from Him? Friends, she is in trouble. Desperate trouble. There is absolutely no way for her to escape poverty alone. And in her distress, she looks to God. Her faith has been severely tested at the loss of her husband, now facing the loss of her children in a life of poverty that stands before her. But in the testing of her faith, there is perseverance. Perseverance to pursue the Lord, despite her troubles, despite the rivers of sorrow. Friend, is the Lord testing your faith today? through some trouble. Will you turn to Him in faithful desperation or will you turn from Him? Will you turn to the One, as Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? You hear that? Paul is saying that, that God has graciously given us all things through Christ. God didn't even spare His own Son for us. Jesus joyfully went to the cross for you. He suffered and died and arose for you so that you can turn to Him in faithful prayer. Will you turn from God or will you turn to Him in prayer? John Calvin put it this way about prayer. It is therefore by the benefit of prayer that we reach those riches which are laid up for us with the Heavenly Father. If you know anything about John Calvin, he was not a prosperity preacher by any means. But listen to what he put. It's through prayer, the benefit of prayer, that we reach those riches which are laid up for us with the Heavenly Father. Are you turning to the Heavenly Father and to His riches? Or are you turning away from Him? Friends, in our petitions to God, we realize our inadequacy. We, we cry out to Him because we need strength. We, we need the power that, that comes ultimately from Him. We, we realize that we desperately need the grace of God. Martin Luther, the great reformer, when he was on his deathbed, is, said to have, uh, is quoted to have said, this is true, we are all beggars. But friends, we can take our begging through prayer to the throne of grace, through our intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ. Could it be that, that we often fail to pray because we don't sense our own inadequacy? Inadequacy. 
Or maybe you don't think you're a beggar. Maybe you think you're deserving. Or, or maybe you're comfortable and you, you live a comfortable life and you're healthy. You have great financial means so you don't sense your own inadequacy that moves you to prayer. Could it be that your pantry and your fridge are full and thus you do not sense a desperate need for prayer for your daily bread? Maybe you think you can just do it all on your own. Uh, a pastor by the name of John Onwacheka put it this way. I have his book on prayer out there on the resource table. He said a prayer, prayer is like breathing for the Christian. Just like we as human beings need breath to live, for Christians we need prayer to live. And some of y'all ain't breathing. Or you're not doing it desperately. We see the desperation of this widow here. Her prayer of desperation really proceeds from faith. To his grace that brought her safe thus far, and grace will lead her home. And so she cries out to Elisha. And, and, and look at his willingness to help here in verse 2. He says, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? He asks her what she has. And you see here in this chapter, there's a contrast here, Right? Look at the way Elisha responds. He says, what, what shall I do? What shall I do for you? Look at the contrast here to what we saw last week, right? In 2 Kings chapter 2, uh, sorry, 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 13, where he says uh, to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. So you see the contrast here in chapter 4 and in chapter 3? To this widow, who we don't even have her name, who cries out to God in faith, he says, what shall I do for you? But to the king of Israel, who had everything, he says, what have I to do with you? Why? Because he had turned his back on the one true God. This woman of no particular status, and really in their society, she would have been the lowest of the low. But the Lord cares for her. Because she and her husband had been faithful and served and feared Yahweh. Friend, you may be of no particular importance to the world. And most of us aren't. Right? None of us have really special status. But you who come to God in faith through Jesus, think of what you have. You have access to the one true God. Who calls us to cast our cares upon Him because He cares for you. Think of the glorious riches of God's grace that we have through Christ. So he says, what shall I do for you? She has nothing. She has nothing except a jar of oil. Hardly enough to get a trust fund going. But for the creator of the universe, the one true God, it was enough. And so he tells her, borrow all the vessels you can get from your neighbors. And you kind of wonder, what, you know, what's, what's our neighbor doing over there collecting all these jars? <laughs> and then she goes, and she obeys. Look at me at verse 5. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. And then the oil stopped flowing. So she goes and she obeys. And God provides abundantly. And then she goes. And God doesn't just provide, right? He provides lavishly for her. Look at me at verse 6. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. He said, There is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God. And he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. And you and your sons can live on the rest. God doesn't just provide for her. He provides abundantly for her. God didn't just supply for her daily need on that specific day, but enough for her to pay off her debts. She had faith, and she obeyed the Lord, and He provided for her. Here we see that God cares for what the world calls the least of these. This woman had nothing, yet God had provided for her. But friends, I don't want to make it seem like a simple thing here. Think about what she had to go through. The stress and the distress that she had of losing her husband. Of almost losing her children. But what did she do? 
She went to the Lord in faith. And she obeyed, and the Lord provided. And so Elijah then tells her to do three, he gives her three commands in verse 7. You see that? He says, sell, pay, live. Go and sell your oil, pay off your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Sell, pay, and live. She who is destined for poverty, having lost her husband, about to lose her family, is now able to live. Instead of living in poverty and seeing her children taken off into slavery, she's able to live because God is compassionate and provides for them. God provides for them, not just their immediate need, but also to pay off their debts, their ongoing needs. They're able to live. What life-giving words those are. Sell, pay, and live. It's like what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think. How often God works that way? Where He does more abundantly than we can ask or think. We see that here, right? With how He provides for this widow and her family. And friends, for those who, who trust in the Lord, God does more than anything we can ask or think. And we see that in the Gospel, don't we? When Adam and Eve sinned against God, they, He could have left humanity in our sin, right there. But at the very beginning, what does He do? He promises that He's going to send a deliverer one day who's going to crush the head of the serpent. Who would crush Satan's head. When Jesus lived His perfect life and He died on the cross and He rose from the dead, He did that in order to secure our debt that we could never afford. That we could never pay back. He saved us from eternal bondage to sin and eternity in hell. Friends, if you are here today and you have never trusted in Christ, do so today. Come to Christ and trust in Him as your Lord and Savior. Friend, if you are here today and you are trusting in Christ, no matter how good or bad your life may be, continue to trust in Him. Serve Him faithfully. And watch your jar, your vessel. For God may make it overflow for you to bless others. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning and thank you for this reminder of how you are a good and loving God. That you are compassionate. That you care for those that society would just throw out. That, that, that you are good to us even though we don't deserve it. Lord, in this widow we see our distress as well. Because our sin is against you. And we deserve only judgment. But Lord, we thank you that you do not spare your only son. And you have done far more abundantly than we can ask or think by giving us life through him. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the life that we have in Christ who paid our debts so that we can go and live free. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Would you please stand and join us in the scene? <laughs>
we go from here, Lord, may we share in the blessings that you have given to us in order to bless others. And Father, as we go from here, may we seek to be faithful witnesses to the life that's available in Jesus Christ alone. We pray these things in Jesus' name.